Hello. Oh, we're on. Hey, yeah. <laughs> yep. welcome hey. to uh, welcome to uh, webinar with Key from Kegland. Uh, I'm Shell from Ölbrygging. I'm Kasper. So we're going to be the hosts and the facilitators uh, for this webinar, and uh, and the whole thing is the whole idea behind the webinar is to actually listen to Key talking about all the great stuff they're coming with from Kegland. And today it's uh, mainly focused on the RAP system. That is the pill, it's the temperature controller, and it's the fridge or the fermentation chamber. Um, so uh, we're not going to talk, you're going to listen to Key, but uh, if you have any kind of question, just uh, bring them out in the feed, and we will make sure that Key gets them when there is time to, to, to have them uh, answered. So uh, Key, are you there? Yes, yeah, yeah. Thanks so much for having uh, having us. Like, uh, you know, it's so it's been so great to deal with you guys. You guys are a really important distributor for us in Europe, and so many of our customers over there get stuff from you guys. Uh, you've got a huge store with uh, so much stuff to choose from. And look, it has been a great partnership. Firstly, I should say uh, with Old Brigging, and you know, anything we can do like this, uh, which can you know help us connect, I guess, with our customer base, I think it's uh, you know fantastic. So thanks for organising it, and really, it's a pleasure. To be to be you know on this uh, this webinar really uh, I love doing this type of stuff and and a great thanks to you as well Key I mean today yeah. you wake up uh, at uh, probably like six or something last last webinar yeah. I think you went up at like three o'clock in the morning didn't you <laughs> yeah yeah, I did. yeah yeah so this is a little bit more of a respectable uh, time frame. Um, yeah. yeah, but uh, but you know, in, in, at the end of the day, look, I'm happy to do whatever suits you guys. So you know, yeah. it's fine. Uh, you know, once start you start talking having about kids, the products, the uh, products, yeah, key, yeah, can sure. you please tell us yeah. a little bit about your position in Kegland? You know, just a short brief. What are you doing there? How did you start? You know, yep. the story. Yeah, sure. Basically, Kegland's now it's uh, four years old, and um, you know, so we're still, I think, like a, a not an old company, I guess, but certainly uh, when we started off at Kegland, a lot of uh, a lot of a lot of the the whole business plan was to basically put a lot of our time and effort into product design and development. So, sort of one of the most exciting areas that I like to sort of work in, I suppose, and that's sort of one of my uh, main jobs. Uh, so. Uh, we do have uh, a general manager who looks after running the business, Oliver, and then we've got uh, you know the staff out the out the back, which are picking packing orders and all that type of stuff. And I try to stay out of most things. I try to sort of stick uh, you know completely in in product development, but but also because I'm a director in the company, I've got to put the other hat on sometimes, and then you know every now and then have to solve uh, other sort of problems as well but but generally where I really love to work is in product development because really that's the most exciting area especially in home brewing uh, and over the last few years you know there's been so many new products come out uh, I feel like it really is a full-time job just sort of trying to keep on top of everything uh, but I work very closely with Dom uh, he'll probably come in in a couple of hours um, but Dom is an old uh, engineering friend of mine uh, I sort of you know, met him at uni university he was a mechatronics engineer uh, probably one of the smartest guys I know, um, but he is uh, also someone who I work very, very closely with. And then since we started doing the rap stuff, we've also got another guy, Trent Devers and Chris Choir, who we've been working very, very closely with. And they do a lot of the software development for the website and also firmware in C programming and stuff like that. So um yeah all four of us talk quite a lot we do outsource some stuff as well but like generally a lot of the design and development is done in our own team mm -hmm. here and then we've got a couple of engineers over in china as well work, work in the china office just so we've got boots on the ground I, I must say it's been really lucky for us especially since uh the coronavirus sort of situation because um you know Keeping an eye on stuff getting manufactured in China is really hard without having people right there. Mm. So having full-time full staff who can go out and regularly sort of see stuff. And, and because there's been no flights available, uh, you know, we've been very lucky to have a team of like 30 guys now in China. Look, just, just sort of keeping an eye on all the, all the shipments and stuff uh, that's getting sent out and manufactured. Um, and it's very hands-on, especially when you bring out a new product because nobody's done anything before. You're ordering sensors. You've got to make sure the cables are correct. So they plug into the board. And you've got to make sure all the boards are manufactured correctly and all this type of stuff. So there's so many checks and balances that need to happen across along the way with new products and stuff like that. Um, so it's a fair bit of work. But it's really exciting because I think with this new wrap platform, 
you know, there's so much that it can do. And it's sort of funny. I remember when we first started off, we, we, our, our demands were quite simple. We think, um, you know, uh, and us, but when we were talking to Trent and, and Chris, we were like, oh, look, we just want some simple software, connect to the web and just log some stuff. And that's it. That's all we want. And it's amazing how quickly uh, bracket creep starts to happen and a project that was supposed to be this big starts to grow into a much bigger project. But once you start getting data feeds in, and you start using sensors, and you're like, well, you know, that kind of sensor would be good too. And you get addicted to sensors, right? Because then you're getting more and more sensors, and you're like, oh, isn't that data good too? And then when you see the interaction of the data, I think once you start to see the visualization of the data, I think, oh, well, that can be really useful. I was just saying to Shell just a moment ago, like when you start to get the pill in and you look at the data, you think, oh, that's funny. And we noticed with a lot of the graphs that people were fermenting, we were coming down, getting lower and lower in gravity, but then you see this little kick towards the end when mm. the gravity starts to increase because people are using pressurizable fermenters. And then because of the carbonation level and the and the CO2 saturating into the solution, you see a little kick in the gravity going up and you think, wait a second, well, maybe, you know, even something like the pill, which you never thought a sensor could be used to potentially sense that carbon dioxide is dissolving in solution, that can actually do that through um, seeing a change in gravity. So it's sort of really kind of cool stuff, which you never really think is going to be useful until you see the data and then it's, you know, once the data is visualized well, then you can really, really make better decisions in the brewing process. And I think in the next few years, we're going to see a whole new sort of area of automation. And, you know, when I first started, automation in brewing was one of those things only the super geeks could get into and it wasn't even really accessible. So people who wanted to program a Raspberry Pi or or get an Arduino board and build something himself. And, and there was that type of uh, sort of hardcore, you know, uh, contingent there with uh, people getting into sensors, but now it's just so available. And I think, uh, you know, there's uh, the software is getting more and more usable. It's getting um, easier to integrate stuff together. Uh, so that's going to be our job for really the next 12 months is uh, not just having you know, the pill connected the internet and the fridge connected the internet, but how they interconnect with each other. Um, so that's sort of really, really important moving forward, I think, um, because, uh, you know, I think that's that's when the products really get a lot, hmm. a lot more clever. Yeah, um, so you, you kind yeah. of jumped right into it here. Should we perhaps introduce Wrapped to the audience? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Wrapped, Wrapped is basically... Um, sort of like our, our internet connected portal, which a lot of our products uh, will connect to. Originally, oh, the fermentation it. chamber. Sorry, we lost you for a bit, a few seconds there. Could you start? Oh, away? yeah. What is wrapped? Oh, yeah, sorry. When we when we first started, uh, wrapped, uh, wrapped was a, uh, wrapped basically our internet connected portal where all our internet connected devices will log to. And also we can control them as well. Um, so if somebody buys a wrapped chamber, for instance, because the wrapped fermentation chamber was the first product to hit the wrapped pl pl platform. So uh, it was a bit confusing because when we started bringing out other wrapped things, I think a lot of people thought the wrapped was the chamber itself, but it's not. It's actually the internet connected part of that. So uh, even, for, for instance, things like the Brazilla Gen 4, that'll be wrapped connected. So it'll log up to that same wrapped platform. And same thing with the uh, even things like these little uh, Bluetooth temperature probes. So they'll uh, give out a Bluetooth signal and then that'll then go on to one of the other wrapped gateway devices to relay that uh, information back to the internet. So there'll be lots of wrapped sort of devices in the whole family of products, uh, which will work with each other uh, hom homogeneously. So um, I, I think, uh, you know, it'll be really cool when you can get something like, um, you know, a thermometer like this, for instance, on the new generation for Brazilla, this will work together with the Brazilla. So the Brazilla itself will be connected to uh, the internet. So because it's got a mains, you know, power plug, we've got a lot more power. So that can easily, um, you know, log data up to the internet. But with the Brazilla Gen 4, because it's logging up to the internet. So let's say we've got this guy here. Um, so, you know, Yeah, so the chips, the chips in the control of the Brazilla Gen 4, um, they're only logging the data up to the internet once every sort of five minutes or so. So because it's only really every five minutes, it takes like less than a second to just log that data up to the internet. It's got actually 
quite a lot of available time where it's not doing anything logging up to the internet it's not talking to the internet all the time so what we can do is take use of the fact that that's got um uh, you know an antenna and a board there that can pick up on bluetooth signal as well and that way we can use these very power efficient bluetooth beacon devices so for instance instead of just taking a temperature reading down the bottom of the boiler and some people when they first start don't quite get that that's the bottom of the boiler it doesn't necessarily mean your whole malt pipe is the same temperature so one of the nice things about you know being able to use a bluetooth probe is we can stick that into the top of the malt pipe and then get a secondary reading of the malt pipe as well so we can get like it would have been very messy for us. We actually always wanted to do this, but it was very messy to do it with wires because if you want to get a cable, you either had to take the lid off or, you know, it, it'd be, you had the cable in the way and you can't have it penetrate through the side very easily because that would stop you being able to pull the malt pipe out. So there's all these complications with doing that before, but now with wireless sort of stuff like this, it sort of makes all of that really possible. So this gives out that Bluetooth beacon and then the actual controller will pick up on the Bluetooth beacon, package up that signal, send them both to the internet so you can see a graph of both of them coming together. And then what we'll have is, um, you know, on the controller itself, you can pass the control of turning on and off the elements onto the Bluetooth beacon signal rather than using the temperature probe at the bottom. Uh, well, wow. when I say rather than, it still uses a combination of the two because you don't want the the, the work to be boiling at the bottom if the middle of the malt pipe still isn't at temperature you sort of want to put caps on it or or what we'll say is uh, thresholds on how far away you can have the two elements away from each other if that, or the two readings away from each other if that makes sense so um that type of stuff i think will make the whole brewing process a lot more usable so if you've got a for instance a probe in the middle of the malt pipe um typically what you did is you just left it long enough that you know that the malt pipe temperature would eventually get to that temperature and you just assume that it's there. But um, if you have a temperature probe in there, what you can do is ramp up the heat to the limit of that threshold that you've set in there. So it forces the temperature up faster. So you can hit that target mash temperature faster. Um, and then when you get to that temperature, not overshoot it because you've got a probe in there, you can then tone it down straight away. So um, that data, that data or that, wouldn't be possible unless we had a sensor right in the middle of the malt pipe, which is very, very hard. Or it's more complicated and messy to do with a wire. Mm. Yeah. And uh, same thing with things <coughs> like the wrap fermentation chamber. So the wrap fermentation chamber, at the moment, all it does is temperature based on the, the probe, which is in the fridge. But uh, we are working on stuff to go into the wrap fermentation chamber as well. So things like, you know, you can pick up on humidity and then control the humidity inside the fridge. So that's, that's quite useful if you guys wanted to start getting into, for instance, uh, meat curing or salami making and that type of stuff. It's a really handy feature. So that's something that down the track will bring out something like this. So, for instance, this little um, Bluetooth uh, device, this will, this will check humidity and you buy it. And the battery in this guy, it's, they, we're, we're told it's going to last eight years. Now, I don't know if that's actually correct or not yet because it hasn't been eight years of testing. But, um, but yeah, we are, we're, we've got a whole bunch of electronics that are arriving soon so we can measure uh, power down to uh, 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 nanoamps. Uh, so basically, once we can do that, we'll be able to test some of this stuff a bit more thoroughly. But hopefully, you know, towards the end of the year, we can maybe get some of, some of this stuff out. So you get this, stick it in the um, uh, the wrapped uh, fermentation chamber, and then you can also get that data stream on top of uh, you know, the temperature, which you sort of currently already get on the graph. So uh, mm. it's kind of really exciting. One thing I do have to clear up, though, as well, is when we talk about Bluetooth, is a lot of people, when they hear that we've got Bluetooth stuff coming out, like a Bluetooth thermometer or the wrapped pill, which is, uh, so the pill, which has got Bluetooth and stuff like that, they think it's about connecting with your phone and think, oh, I want to connect my phone to that Bluetooth device. It's not, that's not really our intention because we haven't really gone gone out there wanting people to sit next because in my opinion it's not really that useful like why would i want to sit next to the pill the hydrometer and have to be within three or four meters to get a hydrometer reading i don't really that's not actually useful at all it's basically just really annoying that i have to be so close i want to be able to get that reading when i'm at work or away or or you know basically get that report up to the internet so um yeah we, i mean we could do it we could actually include it we, we are uh, got an app uh, for Android and also for iPhone, which is coming out very soon, the Wrapped app. Uh, the Android one's already finished, but it's not actually public. 
so I think we'll probably make that public very soon. And the uh, Apple app is uh, should be approved fairly soon. Um, but uh, yes, yeah, so we could actually have the app pick up on a Bluetooth beacon quite easily and just put it on the screen, but we just yeah, it's not a huge amount of functionality that it gives you. Um, so yeah, when we talk about Bluetooth, it's really with respect to uh, picking up on the Bluetooth signal. So devices which use which are powered by batteries can use much less battery, and then using one of the other hardwired devices to grab that beacon and then relay it up to the internet and do the heavy lifting of uh, you know uh, putting it on the internet. Yeah, that makes sense. This is kind of the core of the RAPT system. You have more yep. units that can talk together. Uh, yeah. We have just released the pill in Norway now, so that is the first product yep. uh, from the RAPT series. You just mentioned yep. the, the fermentation chamber. Yep. Uh, and yep. there's also this uh, controller that's coming out. Uh, yeah, yep. And that's the cool yep. thing. You, you can use this controller. It's, uh, yeah, you have it there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And you can use that to get a signal from the pill inside the fermentation chamber to send a temperature reading instead of having a probe going probe going into it. Correct? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's correct. So there's sometimes where we will like some some devices we will actually uh, uh, use the temperature reading to control the heating and cooling. Sometimes we'll just overlay it. So on the device when you pair it, you can pair it and just overlay that graph on the web so when you go into the wrapped portal you can log in and then see both on the graph uh, but other times yeah you'll be able to control it so it depends on what the frequency uh, you've got set on this is for the reporting so for instance as standard out of the box uh, the telemetry for the pill it gives off a signal every once an hour and we did that because of a Bluetooth device. We didn't want it, to, sorry, for a Wi-Fi device, we didn't want to be using a, a crap load of power. And really, most people didn't need gravity, um, you know, more than every 60 minutes. So, you know, it wasn't really necessary. It was just burning a lot of, if we go down to five minutes, it's burning a lot of power. However, if you need to use it for the purposes of temperature control, that way, if we, if we had it Bluetooth only, uh, and we were just using the temperature reading off this, then that would just consume like way too much power um, on, on, you'd basically burn through the battery probably in like, you know, a few months or less than a month, actually, it'd be under a month uh, if we went down to like only a few minutes, for instance. But because we're every hour, it can last up to about a year and a half. So, you know, the, 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 the battery life is, uh, you know, really good when it's just at an hour. But um, yeah, but if we go down to Bluetooth beaconing, we could probably have the Bluetooth beaconing, you know, once every sort of 30 seconds. And that's starting to get in the range where actually, you know, you could easily use that to con control the temperature of this to turn heating and cooling off. That would be uh, a high enough frequency, but that's only co possible through through beaconing. Um, but yeah, we're about to release a, uh, a new firmware on uh, both this device uh, and then we'll also release new firmware on the fermentation chamber. And then after those ones are done, then with the temperature control box firmware will be released. But another nice thing about having everything be able to connect to the internet is we can update firmware as well. So, um, you know, at the moment, for instance, with the temperature controller, you know, the temperature controller only basically controls, uh, it basically has one sensor, obviously. It's just got basically this, uh, this temperature probe here. Uh, we do actually have, if you take it apart, some of you guys, some of you curious guys often take stuff apart as soon as you get it, which uh, I think is a brewer, you know, habit, I think. But you'll notice in there, we've actually got an extra socket uh, on the main board in there for uh, I, I squared C uh, socket. So you can actually plug another sensor in there. And once, you, once you've got an I squared seed socket, uh, you can actually plug all sorts of sensors in there. So our, our intention with the temperature control box is not just to control stuff based on temperature. Once we've got, you know, two plugs on here, we can actually have, you know, maybe one for temperature and one for humidity, turning off a, you know, water mister or something like that. Or one can be based just on a timer, for instance. So it can basically, let's say we had a reason to have one controlling an element and one controlling a pump or something like that and cycling on and off a pump or something like that. So we get, there's lots of stuff you can do uh, once you can just update the firmware. So one thing we do would we do, do do like is the fact that uh, a lot of our customers send us uh, emails and say, 
oh, guys, I love this feature or it'd be great if I could, uh, you know, use this controller for this particular application or, um, you know, yeah, we had one guy who wanted to grow mushrooms and, you know, he said, oh, if we could have this this one on a timer and well, both that both both on timers. So he had one with, uh, you know, uh, you know, controlling, for instance, a misting device, another one controlling lights coming on and off. That would be really handy and stuff like that. So um, it's so easy for us to just make another firmware and release that up to the hub so people can download it and then you can have extra features on there eventually we'll get to a limitation with the amount of memory we have on the board so that's probably you know we'll only have so many different firmware add-ons and then we'll eventually we'll get to a point where we'll run out of memory on the board but you know i think by that stage i think they'll be very very feature packed um mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, being able to update firmware is something which is so much easier for a manufacturer like us because it means we can get something out there, get feedback from you guys, and then hear what the customers want, and then we can you know design the firmware to suit. And all you have to do is basically you know plug it in, and then it'll just flash onto the device, and you'll be able to get those benefits rather than having to throw out a device and continually upgrade everything all the time. Um, you know that's uh, that's probably one of the most exciting things about the platform. We got a question in uh, regarding the RAP system. Uh, does it have integration with Brewfather? Uh, that's something, Thomas uh, Gang. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing this uh, correctly. Actually, maybe Gang Gong Sui. <laughs> Gong Sui. Gang Sui. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> that's terrible. Oh my god. Uh, yeah. So Thomas is Thomas is fantastic to work with, and originally, um, originally what we we just well, we released an API uh, a little while ago, and the API was API was just a one-way API where basically it just sends the information out, and you can you can go and click on it and collect it. But uh, Thomas Gangsoy, yeah, he was like, oh, that's quite good, but I kind of really wanted he wanted webhooks uh, uh, for as well. So uh, it's kind of when when you use webhooks, it sort of can pull the data more efficiently. Um, is probably the best way to describe it in a nutshell without going too much detail. So yeah, basically we're in the process of upgrading the API um, uh, to suit uh, what uh, Thomas Gangsoy was after. And that process should be finished quite soon. I would say within the next <laughs> few weeks, I'd be surprised if that's not done. Sweet. Um, but yeah, it's been well on, well on the way. And it's one, been one of the most requested things. We sell a lot of yeah, well, the Brewfather software. And we recommend it to heaps of people in Australia yeah. uh, because I think the Brewfather software is the best out there. Anybody, <laughs> you still meet the odd person who's still using like beer smithing, like, what are you doing? It's like, this is like way better. No, you should do um, it like us. We do it mandatory. So we always bring out the Brewfather uh, together with the Brusilla. Yeah, we bundle. Yeah, we bundle it. that is, that is, that is probably what we should do. It should be mandatory, I reckon, yeah, because nice. yeah, for, for recipe development, it just sort of, you know, it just makes it so much easier. And he's a total, he's a total genius. I love dealing with Thomas because he's fast, he's responsive, and you know, he's on the ball. He gets stuff updated so quickly. That guy's a total legend. Yeah, I think you really appreciate. It. That uh, shout out. <laughs> He's smiling yep. to you in the chat, at least. <laughs> He's here. <laughs> yeah. You can say hi. Yeah. Uh, uh, hey, Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, there is a few questions more here. Uh, they are obviously wondering about the uh, availability of the Brusilla uh, Gen 4. You have a comment on that? Yep. Uh, uh, yeah. So, um, release dates. Yeah, the Brewzilla Gen 4, I think the only, the, one of the major things we're waiting on now, I think is the CE approvals. So generally what we yeah. do is in Australia, when we release a product, it comes to Australia first. Uh, so we get all the Australian approvals. And then usually after we've got all the Australian approvals and we, everything gets ticked off, then we start the CE approvals and also the UL approvals and the SAA. And there's a long list of approvals. Basically every country's got their different, South America, it's, one of these days, we just all need to get together in all the countries and universalize the you know approval process because it's sort of very, very similar, but then there's little small differences. It's kind of annoying. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes we can pull us up, like we ship, ship something into Canada, you know, they've got like a different system where the, the, uh, you, you, need, you need to show approvals on the component level as well as the whole appliance level. And it's sort of really frustrating with like, things like that. We're constantly sort of 
you know, having to sort of uh, read through standards and stuff like that. But anyway, uh, I think the CE approval should be done um, uh, really soon. I think Lydia in the China office might have been speaking to Shell about that. So I can't remember uh, yeah, what she actually, told you. Yeah, we actually one, had, but... uh, we had a possibility now to order it. So uh, yep. hopefully uh, regarding uh, ETA to Norway, I would say we should be able to sell the Gen 4 and that is the 35 and the 65 in August, yep. September, I would say, is probably. Ah, uh, yeah, good one. Uh, and yep. then, yeah, that's uh, fantastic. Regarding the 100 lit- litres, I pre- guess you know more. Yeah, the 100 litre we've still got to finish off because the first uh, yeah, we, the first elements weren't quite big enough and we ended up making it a little bit, we changed the, d- the dimension to make it a little bit wider. Uh, we just noticed that with the it, it, there's, there's, there's a relationship between the optimum height of the mash tun to the diameter, and we were noticing with the hundred liter with the first one, it was just like the malt pipe was getting too deep, causing us uh, <laughs> sort of a, a few problems with the flow through. So we decided to go through the painstaking process of going larger diameter on that one. So if you look at the different sizes, the the 35 is kind of quite tall. The 65 is more or less the same height or very slightly taller. And the 100 litres sort of very wide and squat. And and really that's because of the dynamics of how, you know, the wort flows through the malt pipe, I suppose. Um, but, yeah, the 100 litre is pretty awesome. It's kind of funny. We're getting a lot of questions about that, even from home brewers. It's sort of – it's become a very grey line with home brewers because, like, home brewers used to be, oh, yeah, you're doing a small batch. And then if, you do, nope. if you've got a commercial <laughs> business, you're doing a very big batch. And that line has been so gray now because we've got like home brewers brewing bigger batches than some commercial brewers and some commercial brewers doing even smaller batches than a lot of home brewers. So um, it's funny. When we sort of started talking about the 100 liter, I thought, oh, you will hardly sell any of those. And maybe like, you know, a few a year or something like that. Uh, but as we've sort of got closer and closer to the finish line with that one, I think, you know, I, I'll be surprised uh, if we don't sell you know, uh, you know, quite a few of those. I think probably we'll see like um, still probably something like 60% of the sales in the 35 and then it'll be 30%, but it'll still be, you know, something like, you know, 20% or something like that or 10, 10 or 20% like that of that total overall Brazil sales will be in the 100 litre, which is still quite mm-hmm. sizable. And yeah. we have a lot of questions regarding the 100 litres. There's a lot of people that are waiting for that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Can you, work, yeah, can yeah, you yeah. walk us through the main differences between Gen 4 and 311? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Like uh, one of the things that we uh, wanted to change was the way that the pump uh, worked and the plumbing on the base of uh, the brewery. So if we look at the bottom of the brewery, um, yeah, we have like the base here, which you can see. And as you can see, see how there's no, there's no cover on the bottom anymore. Basically, you just tip it upside down. Uh, so you can get access to the pump really easily. So some people who wanted to change the plumbing, for instance, so at the moment we've got the pump configuration, so it comes out of the uh, the bottom dead centre of the boiler and then feeds directly into the pump, and then that pump feeds to the tap on the side here. So the tap is now below the element, actually. So previously the, ele- the, the tap was up, up, up above here, so then you would have to then... Uh, you know, open the tap and it wouldn't drain everything out. Now you can drain everything out just using gravity, um, you know, on the tap. So for washing, that's also kind of handy because generally time, by the time you're washing your brewery, um, you're, you've, you've already unplugged it from the power, um, in which case you want everything to drain out completely. And especially once you start getting to the bigger breweries, like the 100 litre in particular, that starts to get a bit awkward to turn upside down and drain it and tip everything out. And a lot of the time you're only tipping out that tiny little bit of liquid there. So what we've done in uh, all of the Gen 4s is have the dish base. So the dish in the, the base of it in the middle is shaped like a dish. It's sort of hard to tell in the camera there, but maybe take my word oh, for it, but it's shaped it. like a, a, a dish like this. So everything drains out completely. Now that was sort of quite complicated because – uh, we make our elements a little bit different to some of the other uh, breweries out there which have a dish base. Uh, we fuse ours to the, uh, the the stainless steel. So we don't use like a thermal paste and bolts to bolt anything on. It basically it's fused on there, uh, which means that it's quite tricky. You have to basically make sure the base is punched and the, the tooling for the casting are made 
quite precisely because the tolerance of where they'll fuse together has to be really, really tight, a uh, perfect match. Um, but yeah, by having that type of configuration on the base, it means that, um, you know, what we can do is we can, for instance, upgrade the pump. So on the 65 and 100 litre, uh, there's upgradable pump options. So if, so if you want to go for a larger pump and pump out quicker, we've had some people who were using like, for instance, like, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, plate chillers, for instance, and they have typically quite a lot more resistance when you try to pump through them. So the small six watt pump in the 65 litre brewery, some people are they're struggling to get a fast flow rate. So now, you know, if, even for things like the 65 litre brewery, you can upgrade the pump, just unscrew the pump in there and then put the new largest, you know, 25 watt pump in there. And then you're going to get like uh, four times the, the flow rate. Um, so, you know, things like that are... Uh, uh, are kind of cool as well. Um, the the screen now sort of tilts up. Some people found that the screen the screen used to be like the, near the bottom of the boiler, but now it's on this sort of holder here, so you can take it off and look at it in your hands like this. But you can also tilt it up so that way you're not like kneeling on the ground uh, to be able to see what's going on. So that's sort of a nice thing. The malt pipe's larger as well. So um, with the malt pipe, actually, I might sh I might share my screen rather than pick everything up. <laughs> yeah, sort of like. A little bit easier, actually. I'll just do this. Um, so, yeah, I think you should be able to see my screen now. So I'll, I'll, I'll just pull up some of the Gen 4 photos here. Just give us one second. Uh, so that's the Gen 4 here. Yeah, as you can see, the screen now is on this little tilt mechanism. So you basically just have these bolts here like that, and then the screen will basically move in and out. So then you can tilt it up or down, as I was saying before. Um, uh, and that's the pump configuration on the other underside. And also, this is the dish base uh, here. Let me just show you this here. Um, yeah, so can you guys see that okay, actually? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, Hi, so, just what, uh, your wife is uh, talking in the chat and making all of us <laughs> 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 saying you're looking good for waking up at 4.45. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> so this is the base of the, uh, of, 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 the, of the boiler now. So as you can see, that's the dish base. And we've, we've reduced this gap here a lot. So this used to be... You know how we, you know how I was saying this tap has moved below. So this tap here has moved below the element. That means that instead of having the tap here, because as soon as we put the tap on the wall, it means that we had to move this false screen up quite a bit, and then we have to move this false screen up a bit. So this false whole false screen here, if we move that up by an inch, then we have to move this up by or the whole malt pipe has to be uh, quite a bit smaller. And then the, the, the compounding effect was quite large in the sense that means we had a much smaller malt pipe um, and just, you know, you couldn't. It, yeah, so now we can do stronger beers. We can do bigger beers. Um, and we've got other add-ons, for instance, like have you guys seen our boiler extension where you put it on the top of the boiler and you can extend the boil volume? Um, so you can actually do more beer as well. So some people using the 35-litre brewery adding on the malt pipe extension on top here and, you know, boiling like, you know, 40 or 45 litres of beer, um, you know, in a single, you know, uh, 35 litre Brusilla. So you could sort of get away with that and you can make really strong beers, especially now that you've got this, um, you know, larger malt pipe. But the other thing and the flip side of it is that it can also do smaller batches too. So if you're like, we're getting an increasing number of customers who also want to do really small batches like five or 10 liters. And by having the malt pipe get closer to the element at the base, we don't have to put anywhere near as much liquid in here. So, you know, we can still have only like a kilo of grain and effectively mash that with the malt pipe in a fully lowered position. Because normally if you tried to do a kilo, you'd have to add a lot of water and it just would be a very low gravity beer trying to brew that beer. So, you know, it's kind of funny. It gives us the flexibility to not only do larger batches, but also do smaller batches out of the same brewery. So that's kind of nice. Um, yeah, how, many but this kilos, all... uh, how many kilos key uh, do you think you could put into a 35 now? Of malt. Oh, that's something I should know off the top of my head. I think uh, I think we get on the previous malt pipe, uh, sort of you know round about 
oh, like I, I better not I better not say specifically because I, actually I don't have the exact answer. I've never actually pushed it to the absolute limit myself. Look, if Oliver was in the office, I'd probably refer that question to over to him, who's used the used the brewery to the absolute limits and filled it right to the brim. But I haven't. I've 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 mainly been doing sort of mid strength beers and stuff like that. And yeah. uh, you know, as I've been getting older, I've also been doing sort of lower alcohol beers as well. Uh, <laughs> so a bit a bit embarrassed to sort of say that, but you know, I do do a bit of that sometimes. Um, but yeah, the malt pipe is about twenty uh, percent bigger. And then we also have, because we've got the malt pipe extension, um, uh, I don't know if you guys have seen this as well. So we also have this device here. So the malt pipe on the standard unit is bigger, but then we also have another even larger extended malt pipe as well. So this one is bigger again. Let me just pull this image up here. So this one's even bigger again, uh, like that. So uh, because these malt pipes are getting even bigger, we actually have two stages. So this is an add-on extra. If you want to have, you know, even higher gravity beers, you can opt to get the additional malt pipe, which is which is even bigger than the standard, you know, one which is 20% bigger. So I can't remember how what what the exact literage this larger one was. Um, but uh, yeah, that's also uh, an additional add-on. And then the, uh, I'll just bring up this photo as well. Um, yeah, this device here. So we did a video on this device a little while ago, the boil, the boil extender. Uh, and that's the that's that's how you join on this extension on top of your standard Brusilla, and that extends the extends the boil volume. So that's what I was just talking about before. So, um, yeah, for for all yeah. the listeners, we are, we actually have them on stock, so we're only waiting for the sixty five, but we have all the other parts. So we will release these extension uh, boilers for both thirty five and sixty five. Yeah, most probably within a couple of weeks. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Nice one. Um, but yeah, one of the other things that I also want to mention was because of this dish base as well, it gives us the ability um, to really more effectively CIP clean. So CIP, CIP, for those who haven't heard of it, means cleaning in place. So that's when we want to basically use a pump like this. Um, and actually, let me just turn the screen share off again. I'll just go back to the camera here. One second. Um, yeah, so CIP cleaning is when we have the brewery sitting in place and without having to get in there and scrub everything, what we can do is use uh, recirculating spray ball or spray jet or something like that. So, so typically, you know, if somebody wanted to use uh, a spray ball to clean something out, uh, they'd buy one of these stainless steel spray balls, and I'm lying around the office here, but uh, they'd buy a stainless steel spray ball. Um, and those spray balls were made in such a way that, uh, you know, they required really large pumps to drive them. And, and they're used commercially because commercially, you know, all the breweries have really large three-phase pumps and stuff like that. So, you know, that's normal. But, you know, CIP in a homebrew uh, situation was very, very hard to do because it meant that for a brewery like this, you know, there's not much point getting a brewery like this and then putting a huge three-phase pump into the base of it or something like that. It's just not feasible. Uh, or even even a very large single phase pump, it's not really feasible because it's like really too big and you don't really need a lot of flow to just to recirculate the word. So we went out on this mission a little while ago. Um, simultane simultaneously, when we started the Brazilla Gen 4 with the dish base, we also started another project to make um, a new type of CIP spray ball, which is very efficient at basically getting the flow through the pump, like being able to use a very low volume and low pressure pump, but still be able to throw the liquid, um, you know, out of the uh, out of the spray jet and rotor. So. Yeah, this this was a lot of stuffing around, I'll say, because um, with flow dynamics, especially in you know, even if you get really good software, like you know, SolidWorks has some great uh, you know applications there where you can actually put liquid flow through something and see how it interacts. But 
when you get to the stage of actually seeing like, uh, you know, chemicals throw out of a spray ball, you, it's something you just very, very hard to model actually, and you just have to make it. So uh, we spent a number of months making a lot of 3D printed parts and then, you know, getting them to spin, but the surface of the 3D prints is never perfect. So there's a lot of stuffing around. I spent days like sanding stuff down and trying to coat stuff with certain uh, a certain, uh, you know, like I was dissolving ABS and then trying to uh, deposit that onto the uh, 3D prints to smooth the surface off. And, you know, anyway, so we basically had a heap of different, um, you know, models that we made uh, of, uh, of, of, of spray rotors. But what that means we can do is we can get a, a, you know, a very efficient rotor like this, which will basically use the very small six watt pump and we found like after we optimized these little fins on here with a, you know, to throw liquid out, we found with a six watt pump, we could go through this spray arm and it could throw up to about 40 centimeters in diameter, which means we can actually use, we could even use a six watt pump even in like the 100 liter brewery, not that we will, because the 100 liter brewery deserves a bigger pump. But, you know, it means that we could, for the first time, have a very effective CIP spray system inside the brewery so you know you can just put the lid on and have this connected to the hose like that um, and then it will spray and clean out uh, the brewery itself but one thing is once you've got a brewery that can clean itself out the next thing is oh why don't we use the brewery to clean other stuff out as well because we've got something which can you know can warm up some water we can chuck some chemicals in so naturally i think what we'll start to see is people wanting to also use this type of cip and this type of brewery to then clean out things like their fermenters so you could basically park this next to your conical fermenter heat up some uh you know you know chemicals pbw or because generally most of the cleaners will work better when they're in elevated temperature and especially in a place like norway i imagine the tap water is quite cold so if you try to use a lot of the chemicals the effectiveness will be quite low if you mm. you know especially if your water is only like five ten degrees or something like that but you get up to say 25 or 30 degrees you know that chemicals that chemical reaction is like happening you know a lot better so if you are able to get a brewery like this and then use a cip i can swing that guy swing that arm around and then you know put this guy on the end and then basically use that to cip you know something else so i think that's kind of really exciting because cip has always been one of those things which is really cool to have but you know, it hasn't really been easily accessible to a lot of home brewers, and 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 this really simple. It's actually remarkably simple when you see it. It's not much, not much to it. Actually, I'll bring it up on the screen here. So I'll share screen again like this. Uh, yeah. So if you see this spray rotor, uh, we made a number of different designs. This was it ended up being the most efficient. So yeah, it's got a, it's got a. A rotating rotor like this which spins around and then when you see it it just sort of looks like this when it spins around i'll just pull this up now okay so oh yes yeah, so these are the typical type of uh, stainless steel spray jets i suppose you might see so that's why most of them in the market and yeah, if we even use our large 65 watt pump it can just make this turn slowly but really they don't work properly so um yeah for for the small pumps that we use in the breweries we're able to do stuff like this um and you can see that spinning there so you can see it's sort of th easily throwing out to the 40 centimeter mark and really you're even getting droplets out to 50 and 60 centimeters when you can see that spray ball uh, or that spray rotor spinning and we're getting good coverage even going upwards too so even if you were to have the lid on the boiler um, you'd be able to spray this would be spraying back up against the inside of the lid so you know you're getting quite good coverage so hopefully people find that they're hardly scrubbing at all at most you might be able to you might have to just get a sponge and just clean the edges a little bit but you know uh, that's kind of cool to be able to um, to just have that add-on uh, if you remove the spray uh, rotor from the jet you can also get we're, we're doing some experiments with also using it as a sparging device um so i'll sort of show you this oh i don't have that photo on here actually yeah it doesn't matter but yeah you can also use it as a sparging device because some people wanted to um 
uh, I'll just switch over the camera. Yeah, because some people wanted to actually, uh, I've seen some people use these sort of little sprinklers or, look, I saw one guy actually do it, get a shower head, <laughs> like a conventional shower head and then put it on top of his brewery. So it would go through a shower head and sprinkle on top of that. But actually the one device, if you just take the rotor part off like that, this actually works quite well to just fan the, um, the, the wort out over the uh, malt pipe. So, you know, you could sort of like use a double purpose device or you could actually use it to aerate wort going into your fermenter as well. So that's another thing one guy said. So you basically use this and instead of just pumping directly out of the hose into the fermenter, you just go like that and it fans it out and you'll aerate more once it chills down. So, you know, it, it, it could be useful. And that's one of the reasons why I put this fairly long half inch thread on here. So it could actually be mounted. Uh, so you just get two half inch nuts and you could mount this to the lid of other pots as well. If you got like, you know, let's say a three vessel system or something like that, you just drill a hole in there, use normal half inch nut, bang, bang. And then you can make your other pots also uh, CIP able. So yeah, kind of, kind of a really cool device. Um, then what else is it? That's probably most of it for, oh, we also got a new distillation lid. So the new distillation lid is as well is something which we're, got coming in i've just got this one here so yeah like you're probably gonna have Brazil... to go quick through that one uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, we're not that uh, privileged up here in norway <laughs> yeah uh, I'll, go, I'll go really quick basically the distillation lid we had to make a lid like this because people i think in norway especially you guys are requesting the steam condenser uh yep. and yep. you know i think you guys are just starting to sell the steam condenser but yep. Um, you know, once you put the steam condenser on, it's kind of annoying because then you can't get the hops in the boil anymore. So yeah, then we had to make like a little sight glass like this. So there's a tr three inch triclover on the front of the lids. Uh, and then you can take this off. And then this is actually a plastic, this is a plastic sight glass, but we just started injection molding these out of a really cool plastic called PPS. Uh, PPSU. So it's a type of clear grade of polysulfone. It's it's actually many times more expensive than stainless steel. So it's kind of like a bit weird when people feel like you're spending more money to get plastic than it is to get stainless steel. But anyway, if you want to make it see-through, you kind of have to do it. So um, yeah, that's sort of something that's come out. And also it'll be handy if people have got a steel attached to the top because then you can take this off and chuck botanicals in without having to remove the entire lid and stuff like that. So yeah. that new sort of new, new lid will be available on the 35, 65 and 100 litre uh, shortly. Um, and the 35 yes. and 65 so, will be backwards compatible? Uh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, so that, that yep. lid will be backwards compatible to all the different models because one thing we've kept the same is all the different brewery diameters and we've sort of been wanting yep. to be quite rigid there so that way all the stuff like false bottoms and all that stuff's all compatible and, you know, larger malt pipe, malt pipe extensions and boil extenders and stuff like that are all, all backwards compatible. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, all right. Yeah, we probably should move on from Brazil because we haven't actually touched on much else, actually. <laughs> and we're kind of running out of time. Oh, we talked yeah. a bit about the uh, wrapped. Yeah. Uh, like yep. we mentioned, we, we just released the pill here in Norway. Uh, yep. We sent out yep. an email about uh, that uh, one hour before this. So that's out yep. there now. Uh, yep. We had a question about when will this fermentation chamber be available in Norway? We also have a note on that. Yep. It's shipped uh, from China, so hopefully I would say um, in uh, end April, beginning of May. Yeah, at the mm. earliest, Ah, yeah, probably. fantastic. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really exciting area. I think the wrap fermentation chamber, it's one of those things that I've really wanted myself because, you know, I have played around with glycol chilling and look, we sell heaps of glycol chillers and stuff like that, but there's something neat about not having to worry about the liquid with glycol. And obviously for most home brewers, it's not like a commercial brewery where the tanks are sitting in the brewery permanently mounted and you know stuff like that like with home brewing you're disconnecting stuff and you're washing stuff in a sink generally and stuff like mm. that and moving it around and having glycol hoses connected to the you know breweries to the fermenter is kind of really annoying so i, I find actually just sticking the whole fermenter in a fermentation chamber a lot easier mm. to use a lot lot neater and really it does a better job at keeping a very stable temperature inside the fermenter where glycol doesn't always do that um so and also the yeah. multi, i think the multi functions you have on the on the chamber is also interesting i mean you talked about uh, people growing mushroom dry aging yep. of uh, of uh, meat so there's a lot of functions yeah. you can actually use this for could you Not show yeah, us definitely. a few pictures so uh, they see what you're talking about yeah, 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 yeah. So the fermentation chamber. So, do you want me? Did you say you were going to show some pictures, or do you want me uh, to bring up the fridge? Could you please? 
Oh, yeah, sure. Yep, yep, okay. Um, let me just share screen here. Okay. Yeah, one thing we were actually trying to do was trying to get the fermentation chamber to go to really hot temperatures as well. So that's something. So this is the fermentation chamber here. Uh, we actually started to do some exper experimentation on the fermentation chamber um, uh, with uh, temperatures up to 80 degrees. Um, because once we get up to those hotter temperatures, you can actually pasteurize in the fridge too, which is something which even a lot of the other meat chambers can't do. But in the future, I think what we might be doing is bringing out another wrapped fermentation chamber, which is all steel lined. We did find that at the really high 80 degrees Celsius, the insides of the fridge, everything's starting to get too hot it's really too hot for plastic so um, i wouldn't be surprised if in the future uh we have a metal lined one that can then pasteurize because if we can pasteurize in there that opens up even a whole nother sort of area that we can get into because um for instance if you're doing things especially like you know mushrooms and stuff like that or um you know if, if you get the wrong type of bacteria or spores in there they can sort of really take off um, especially if you've got a very humid environment so being able to do a cycle of pasteurization and then sort of start mushrooms growing is really handy and that's sort of one thing that we've sort of heard from some of the guys um who who, who are using this sort of for mushroom growing and then same thing with meat curing as well actually so um yeah we found with meat curing uh we've been playing around with some uh sort of uh, add-ons to put in here so we've got a little dehumidifying device we've been doing some experimentation with dehumidifying using a combination of the heating and the cooling plate in the back of the fridge at the same time uh, which does a respectable job so you can yeah remove moisture that way but um, I think probably the more likely add-on accessory we'll bring out is just a completely independent uh, dehumidifier uh, because it works, which will work faster than using that combination of the heating device and the chill plate at the back of the fridge. Um, but when you can uh, dehumidify quickly, um, it can make it really useful for doing like, you know, you know, fairly small or small diameter sausages and stuff like that, which you can draw the moisture out of uh, faster. Uh, but if you've got really large chunks of meat, generally, you know, you want to basically decrease the humidity in a much slower fashion so you don't get a crust and then don't get the middle of the meat going off and that type of thing. There has been some requests for some customers who have wanted things like uh, pH probes. That's quite complicated. So I don't know if we'll do that because obviously with meat curing, um, uh, yeah, you can. If you only use temperature, then and humidity, that's fine. It does a respectable job. But from a commercial point of view, um, you know, some of the really advanced sort of, you know, meat curing companies that uh, do it for a living really want to get like a, a, a probe which goes in there and, and checks pH of the meat, um, because if you can check the pH of the meat, you can really be sure that you're you're not going to run into any problems in the meat going off or anything like that. So uh, we are sort of looking at it, but the the, the probes uh, which do pH monitoring are quite expensive. We're hoping that we can work with one manufacturer to bring the price down a bit. Um, but that's something that, yeah, might be sort of further out in the pipeline. But, um, yeah, so that's something that uh, is kind of cool. Or even like drying out other stuff, like drying out vegetables and stuff like that. You could use it for things like that too. So let's say if you want to dry your own banana or something, I don't know, preserve your own foods, um, then you can then you can do that too. So there's lots of exciting stuff in the future. Uh, but it's one of those things that, you know, we've got so many different wrap products now that we're working on simultaneously. It's It's sort of like hard to sort of, prioritize which one we should finish first or which add-on we should bring out next. Uh, I think once the brewery's out and we've got definitely a couple more builds on the firmware for the uh, temperature controller and also the uh, wrapped pill and then probably we'll come back to the fridge and or the, uh, the fermentation chamber and then we'll start working again on um, some more uh, uh, upgrades there. But because a lot of these devices are interconnected, um, we have to do a lot of work also on the on the new profile uh, management, uh, which is sort of a bit messy because at the moment it's the profiles are quite easy. You basically set temperature and time, 
And then, you know, it makes a very simple profile. But one of the big jobs we've got at the moment is how do we make a profile with multiple bits of data input? So, you know, if your gravity is this, then do this. Or if the gravity change over a certain period is this, then, you know, jump up in temperature. However, don't exceed this temperature. And after a certain amount of time, then do this. So that, that they start to become very complex profiles. So I think we one of the things that we have to do is really do a major overhaul of the whole profile system. Um, uh, so that way it can you can you can have a profile which relies on multiple different inputs and then have multiple different actions that can be sort of a little bit like in that website if this if this then that I guess if you I don't know if you guys have ever used I uh, if this then that but um, you know similar to that where you get multiple data inputs and then it can think about it and then have you know different things it can do whether it's uh, increasing temperature or turning a pump on in a in a in a, uh, in a brewery or something like that so. Um, yeah, that, I think we've got sort of quite a lot of uh, sort of firmware development there first before we then go back and then make uh, and finish the add-ons for the, the, the salami, but definitely it's in the pipeline. Uh, so I can sort of, you can sort of expect that to happen sort of probably sometime early next year, I would say. Yeah, that sounds great. So just to sum up what you just said there, you talked about uh, this and that and all that. I, I fiddled a bit with it, so I'm familiar with the, the logic behind it. But to put it in an easy, easy way, you, you can have something measure your uh, gravity and yep. you have something that control your temperature and you can program it pretty much to say when you reach this gravity, change the temperature to this. But you yeah, can, you exactly. can make these steps so it pretty much does it automatically. You don't have to check the gravity and then adjust the temperature. You just put up a profile and it does it for you. Yeah, definitely. Well, actually, yeah. it's sort of it's one of those things where it's 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 gravity's really kind of handy, and that's what everyone uses at the moment. But one thing that will be a major part of that process of automation, it will be the gravity velocity. Actually, is what we're talking about. So these days, everyone sort of talks yeah. about gravity, but you know, if you're starting a beer, how how much confidence? Like, let me ask you right now, how much confidence that you know is that going to be be you know, like? You, 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 if you're bringing a recipe the first time, and most home brewers they do all recipes for the first time because every recipe is different. They may, you know want to experiment with the new yeast and new hops and stuff like that. <laughs> and one of the difficulties is you don't actually know when the gravity is going to be what, what term what what your final gravity is going to be. You, you, you think it's going to be 10 10, it might be 10 15, or it might be 10 13 or something like that. So it's very hard to say from the beginning the beer's done at 10 10. Because you just don't know if it's going to get there. So, you know, one of the things that really our decision is made on is gravity velocity. It's not not terminal gravity or final gravity or whatever. It's basically that how quickly that gravity is changing. So very soon on the wrap portal, we'll have a graph not just with gravity, but it'll say gravity velocity. And one is a function of the other, of course, because one's just looking at the change over time and then, you know, plotting that on the graph. But um, you know, if you look at the whole process of when you jump up into a diastole rest, we don't jump up into the diastole rest really at a specific gravity necessarily. We can actually have the gravity velocity trigger that. So when the gravity is increasing at a certain rate or that starts to slow, that's really when we want to jump the temperature up to a diastole rest. Same thing with crash chilling. Like we want to crash chill not at a certain gravity because we don't know what that what that's going to be. We want to crash chill when it stops actually um, changing. We, so, mm. you know, it, 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 it being able to get a yeast that you've never used before, let's say, and if we know that that particularly, let's say somebody brings out a new strain of, you know, quick yeast or something like that, and then, um, you know, you can, you can plug in and just say, look, I want to basically, you know, uh, trigger the you know diastole rest at this particular gravity velocity and then i want to crash chill at this gravity velocity you can essentially automate that process in entirety rather than having to put in gravities you can never ever use the yeast before and brew the beer perfectly if you're taking the velocity into account so i think that's like a really really important thing with the with the pill and something that we the data hasn't been displayed yet but once we start displaying that i think that's a much more exciting bit of data to have on the wrap portal yeah cool and i guess also collecting all that data in the wrap system will give a lot of handy information to all brewers i mean how does the different yeasts yep. react yeah 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 yeah, yeah. yeah definitely uh, good data 
Yeah, uh, definitely. So, for instance, I think what we need to do, uh, and this is a sort of discussion we had uh, a little while ago, is you know, actually using you guys to contribute data that we can all share it with each other. So, for instance, if we got um, you know enough people actually telling us what yeast they're using for a batch, so we could have a certain stream of people who say, look, I don't mind being part of a certain community. And that way we can have everybody who's using, you know, let's say uh, the Vedant yeast or something like that. They can say, I'm using the Vedant yeast for this recipe. And that way we can have a look and see, oh, that temperature over, um, over that time uh, using, you know, that amount of pressure and that particular settings or that gravity of wort, it basically ferments out on that scale and then if you if you use a lot of data stream like that we can then basically you know have predictive graphs so it's something that nobody does at the moment because nobody knows what it's going to do it's it's kind of funny we're at this industry with so many people in it but actually there's still a lot of mystery out there with what's going to happen so um, by getting those data streams if we collect that data from you guys on something like the wrap portal uh, what you could do is then just plug in what temperature you want and actively you'd be able to then see the data predictively saying, if I ferment at this temperature, oh, I can see I'm going get, to get to uh, final gravity on this day. But, you know, even if I speak to, um, uh, you know, fermenters or I speak to um, Lullaman right now and say, you know, ask those questions, they wouldn't be able to answer it. Even their top guys, they say, oh, I think it's going to probably do that. But there's simply not enough collected data with you really yeah. have to collect thousands and thousands of batches of data to be able to see every single different combination of what gravity of wort to, you know, you know, what temperature is going to ferment out to give you a good graph and predict that what it's going to be so you know i think there's so much cool stuff as i was saying before you know looking back to when we first started thinking you know this was such a small scope and it's sort of the whole rap portal and the whole uh when you get all this cool data there's so much stuff you can really it's like endless what you can end up doing with it great could we uh, round out uh, with talking a little bit about the new firm Silla design uh, I got the question oh, yeah, so sure. someone someone was really hoping to see the hoppong for example oh. <laughs> yeah it's gonna yeah, the, the it's funny bong, how yeah. we laugh every time you bring it up yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's got but people say it's all sorts of stuff it's like oh can it be used as a penis pump because uh, you know like, anyway uh, <laughs> probably I don't know maybe <laughs> but um yeah, basically, uh, is my wife still on, actually? Yeah, maybe I missed that. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, basically, uh, yeah, that's the hot bong there. So the hot bong's made out of, uh, um, uh, yeah, nylon 12. So it's quite a strong uh, engineering grade uh, clear plastic. Uh, we were thinking, actually, about making some of these out of PPSU, too, because if we make it out of PPSU, you can actually use it for distillation as a site class. So you could put this in the column. So we're thinking about doing that. Uh, but also, we've got other people using these for things like... Um, actually, I'll go back to the original. The, the, the original uh, use for this is really to add hops. So I'll just show you that quickly. Otherwise, I'll be could carried away. Can you turn off the share screen on your show on camera? Oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, let me just do this uh, one second. There we go. Okay, so I'll switch over to the camera again. Um, yeah, so this is the uh, the new Firmzilla uh, with the with the cone base, and yeah, this is something that this is something that we've been trying to do for a very, very long time. I remember when we first bought our first blow molding machine back in like 2000, 2014, we commissioned our first blow molding machine, a long time ago. And we tried to make this type of shape, but it's very, very hard to get the plastic to blow into the mold, um, you know, down at that shape. So we had to sort of, there was a Japanese company called Nisei, which have a very interesting technology where uh, they have a blow molding machine where after it blows the preform form, so you start off with a preform like this. So you start off with a preform like this, uh, and you have to heat the preform up. Um, you have to heat the preform up, and then you have to basically blow the plastic into a large, what they call a blow cavity. <clears throat> so when you blow it into the blow cavity, uh, it's very, very hard to get the plastic to go right down the bottom into these kind of overhangs and you ju we just couldn't get enough thickness and we just couldn't get it to work and we spent like six months you know making machinery getting molds done and every time you like 
you make more molds. You're like, oh, this is really expensive. We're just basically dumping money down the drain. And you're basically like, you know, yeah, going through this sort of process of doing more and more molds. Um, but then, uh, yeah, you, it, it was very, very hard to do. So we abandoned that. And I think it was about 2016. We'd already given up on being able to do this. But then, yeah, more recently, uh, yeah, we were sort of looking at some of the uh, technology which uh, this other, uh, you know, company in Japan had come up with where they basically heat the bottom of the blow cavity. So you can basically kind of like after you've blown and finished the product, essentially you're sort of heating apart and then reforming it into another shape. And we'd never tried to do that, but it's very complex. You sort of like, you know, heating it and cooling it, heating and cooling and reshaping it and stuff like that. But that has enabled us to make this shape at the bottom of the Firmzilla, uh, which is what we always had tried to do. Oops. Um, and now with the bottom of Firmzilla, it's got a triclover ferrule right at the base. And that is like so exciting. And, you know, it's a massive relief after spending like, you know, almost a decade trying to make this uh, is, you know, being able to be finished. So this is something that, uh, you know, I'm truly excited and kind of relieved that we've we've done all this work and finally got here. So, um, you know, you can just use a triclover clamp to connect the uh, big dump valve. So it's now a different type of dump valve. There's no threads at all on the dump valve, uh, uh, butterfly valve. Um, it's just got a large, big three inch opening at the base. And then that dumps straight into the dump valve like that. Uh, we're still using the same 90 degree cone. I'm surprised that we haven't seen more 90 degree cones to be honest with you, because we did a lot of experimentation. It's funny how in brewing, there's so many kind of myths out there. And when we first started manufacturing conical fermenters in plastic, you know, we did a lot of experimentation on the cone angle. And a lot of people would say, oh no, brewing, you've got to have a 60 degree cone because that's what everyone said and that's what everybody thought we needed so we thought well maybe is that actually necessary we should probably do some testing there so we started to reduce the like reduce for the cone angle or increase the cone angle so instead of having a 60 degree cone and the problem with a 60 degree cone is it, it takes up a lot more space so if you've got a 60 degree cone it makes the whole fermenter bigger and look for a large commercial brewery they probably don't care they've got lots of factory space and the roof's really high so they don't, if a 60 degree, degree cone not a big deal but for a lot of guys at home trying to fit this in the cupboard or the garage or under the bench or, you know, something like that. It's really hard if you start making these cones unnecessarily. So we started to increase the cone angle. And honestly, like we found that with the 90 degree cone, we were just getting, you know, the yeast fall down just as well as it would in a 60 degree cone, which is why I've always sort of kind of kept that. But now with the six, now with this cone and with the inside being all smooth and a large three inch dump valve, all the yeast just goes like straight down there, which is kind of really nice. There's nothing for it to catch up on or anything. So here's like a, here's a, this is actually a batch. So I've moved this around a bit, but you can see there's like not a single bit of yeast on that cone, which hasn't gone down there. It just goes straight down into that collection container at the base there. Um, <clears throat> Uh, yeah, and straight into the collection container and being able to take the parts apart so easily, like just be able to undo that and then, you know, take off the collection container. It just makes it, you know, so, so, so much, so much simpler. So that's kind of an exciting thing. And in combined with the hot bong as well, which goes on top, I think it's a really, really cool feature. So, you know, on the top of the lid here, this is an upgradable lid. So, the standard lid that will come with the firm Zilla is the one that you guys are already familiar with. But some guys who want to upgrade, you can get this lid here and then use the hot bong, which goes on top. Uh, that looks like this. Where is it? Oh, well, misplaced it anyway. <laughs> yeah. Yes, had it ready to go. <laughs> oh, I'm going crazy. Where did I put that? Um, Oh, yeah, sorry, just underneath this bit of paper here. Yeah, so the hot bong goes on top like that. So now we can basically purge hops out and then um, get them into the fermenter. But the hot bong is a multi-purpose device, and I'm not talking about those purposes, which I was mentioning before. Um, the, but it's a multi-purpose device in the sense that it can be used for other things. So anywhere where you're using a sight glass in a brewery, like sight glasses, you know, typically the sight glasses that you buy are made out of glass, 
which if you drop them, they can smash. And also the pressure rating is not really very suitable. So if you look at the side glasses, most of them are only rated to one bar. But if you look at all the Firmzillas, they're rated to 2.5 bar. So it became a bit of a risk for us. It's like, do we really want a glass thing which could potentially explode, which you were you know, sending out to home brewers? And side glasses were getting used for other means as well, like, for instance, inline carbonation. So what you could do with the hot bong, for instance, is something like this. So you've got like, for instance, uh, you know, this has got like a hot bong with two uh, PCO uh, carbonation caps on either end. And then we've got like just another carbonation cap with a uh, carb stone on it. So you can basically drop this in that angle like that. And then you can turn this device into a uh, an inline carbonator or, or, or inline oh, oxygenator cool. for that matter. So what we could do is like put pure oxygen in here and then have the wort go in this way and then come out that way and then go into your fermenter, for instance. So, you know, you could use it for dosing stuff like that or um, uh, or even in a distillation column. So if we make some of these out of uh, the PPSU, because uh, PPSU has a similar shrinkage to nylon 12, it's not quite perfect but it's close enough that we can run both plastics out of the same mold so we get ppsu and then uh, injection mold uh, that then what we could do is put this in a distillation column and use it as a side glass in the distillation com column and see what's going on inside there so you, let's say if you had a boil over you'd be able to sort of say oh yeah i've got a boil over i immediately i can turn the elements off well while it's a bit of a mystery if you've got a stainless steel column and can't see what's going on inside. So, yeah, I think there's – it's just kind of a useful shape. Being able to have something see-through, uh, tri-clover, and also with a port, which you can add stuff, it's just going to be useful, you know, for lots of other applications, I think, not just necessarily adding hops into a fermenter only. So, um, yeah, I think that's kind of a really exciting product. And the pressure rating on this is quite high. It can actually handle like 10 bar. So, you know, mm. it's quite high for this part. Um, so even like mains water supply and stuff like that, be able to put through there. Yeah. Thank you. For um, that. I did get a question yeah. from the side there. People are, uh, pe some people are a bit curious about that slightly modified uh, Cornelius keg you have in the background there. <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, this one. Okay, this was not this was not on the agenda, but yeah, this is this is more just a testing keg. So we use this for. So for instance, if we wanted to test, um, well, let's say if we wanted to test the CIP mechanism, washing the inside of the keg out, we can do it like this. This one we made actually because uh, we we've been doing a lot of testing with. Um, yeah, bladders. So we've got like bladders like this. Yeah, it's so got bladders like this, which we've been uh, lining inside the kegs. Uh, so. Yeah. So basically on the lid of the keg, this will be inside the keg. So that way we can dispense the keg using um, compressed air rather than inert gas. Um, it also means that like, you know, you'd be able to use the bladder for uh, other things which aren't carbonated. So things like English beers or something like that, or, or, yeah, or very wine. low carbonation or wine or something. So that's something that's on the side. So it made that keg to do, it's more of a, you know, test testing uh, rig for us to do testing on things like that. So yeah, a bit of an odd, odd sort of Frankenstein looking device. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. We are, Do we have any questions? Uh, yes. Yeah. Let me see if there's a few questions. We are a bit over time, yep. but it's really fun to, yep. to listen to what you have to say. Yep. Uh, I suggest that I just uh, that we just go through the the thread afterwards and answer questions regarding we can absolutely uh, releases that. and so on. So we can just answer that afterwards in the thread. So, but if there's any questions for Kida? Yeah, I think we, we covered most of it uh, along the way anyways. Yep. Uh, there's yep, a few yep, questions yep. Uh, about this, uh, is, uh, this compatible with that and so on. I think it's nice to just go through and see if there's something you want to answer perhaps in the yep. chat afterwards. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, no problem at all. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, yeah, 
definitely plenty of uh, really cool stuff up on the horizon. And look, we'd love to get your feedback, especially especially because we've got so many customers over there. So really, the one thing that I really want to stress the most is if you guys want to see something and you've got some, some device or add-on or accessory you want us to make or new sensor you want us to use, just please let us know and um, you know we'll add it. Because every, every week we have a product development meeting we get together as a group in the office here and we discuss all the new ideas and brainstorm and, and, and toss them up and, uh, and see what people come up with. And, and quite a lot of the time, it's customers' ideas which are coming forward. So, you know, I think, you know, keep the uh, lines of communication open and, and, and let us know what you guys want to see. Absolutely. Yeah. And we are getting a lot yeah. of feedback directly from our customers too. They are... They, yeah. they know that we, we we take in pretty much all the Kegland products now, so they, they reach up yeah. up to us uh, in front. They, they see your coming in news, they, they reach yep. up to us, and they have a thousand questions. Uh, yeah, yeah, so, yeah. so we have a good line on that, absolutely. Yeah. And also, when we pick up things, we have uh, experienced a lot of times that uh, when we bring it out to you, it's just a matter of short time before you actually implement and do changes. Absolutely. You know, yeah. when it's a European standards doesn't fit or whatever. So I, I'm, yep. I, I'm really uh, impressed by the speed you have in, in implementing new, yep. you know, new yeah. designs and new technology. It's, it's amazing. So, uh, yep. I mean, thumbs up for that. And uh, it's, uh, yep. it's a joy working with you. Definitely. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, and look so. forward to getting over to see you guys. So, yeah, Shell's coming over to Australia, which is really cool. And yeah. then I'm actually coming over to Norway in the middle of the year. So, yeah, really look forward to getting out and seeing you guys and seeing how, yeah. how, you, how you guys do stuff because it's an impressive plan. Like I've seen the video of you showing me around the site and it's huge and uh, really cool to see all the automated packaging you've got to pack up like all the, all the homebrew kits and stuff like that, you know. Right. So hopefully, um, you know, we can even collaborate on, you know, all, all, all of the other parts of the business, even outside of Absolutely. hardware. Yeah, uh, yeah, I'm sure we can. Yep. So, yeah. So uh, thanks a lot, Keith, for spending uh, spending this uh, your time with this, this morning, webinar, this morning <laughs> yeah, for you. Yep, yep, and, no uh, yeah. And uh, thanks to all the viewers. There's been yep. like 200, 250 all the time. Eh? Mm. Been a lot of people yep, yep. watching this. So yep. um, have a good night and a good morning. Yeah, we'll do. <laughs> yeah, awesome. No all right. Thanks so much, guys. Okay. Nice Appreciate Friday. Yeah. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs> yeah. Bye-bye. Okay. All right. See ya. Bye.